Welcome everybody to our webinar series. Today, talking about ketogenic diet in super refractory status epilepticus. With us is Neha Kull. She is, a, she is our dietitian and will be talking to us today about her experience with these cases. Neha completed her, a Bachelor of Nutrition and, Diet, and Dietetics with honors at Deakin University, Australia. She has been accredited practitioner, practicing dietitian with Australia for over 10 years, in neurosciences and critical care nutrition. Neha is currently senior dietitian in the comprehensive epilepsy program at the Alfred Hospital and researcher at, in the Department of Neuroscience Center Clinical School, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia. Her clinical research interests focus on the development and implementation of dietary therapies for adults with epilepsy and other neurological conditions. Dr. Kaul is an active member within the ILA, ILA Yes, and the Epilepsy Society of Australia. Dietitians Australia and the Ketogenic Dietitians Research Network. Neha's presentation today will discuss the clinical aspects and challenges of administering ketogenic diet therapy in the treatment of adults with super refractory status epilepticus. Welcome, Dr. Kaul. Thank you for the introduction, Manuela, and uh, thank you to ILE, yes, for this invitation to present in their webinar series. I think over the last 18 months, they've really put together a fantastic program, um, and I'm delighted to be involved. So today's learning objectives for the webinar are to demonstrate knowledge of indications, limitations, and risks of ketogenic diet therapy, and this is the third webinar um, in this series um, and I encourage you to have a look back at these previous two webinars that have also been presented. So in 2015 the ILAE published this paper on the definition and classification of status epilepticus and really looking at these two important time points. So firstly the time at which we recognize that a seizure has, is prolonged and there hasn't been that mechanism for termination of the seizure. And this time point is really dependent on the type of status epilepticus. Then we move on to this second time point. And this is really where we start to see neuronal injury and neuronal death. And uh, it's a very short treatment time that we're looking at. So really under 60 minutes. There are diverse causes of status epilepticus, and these may be acute, remote, progressive, and, and other or unknown. And so given the, the heterogeneity of the presentations, it's why it makes this condition so difficult to treat. Now, the most common treatment pathways we see for patients that present with status epilepticus um, is this first line management with benzodiazepine and then a second line treatment with an anti-seizure medication. However, patients that then fail to respond to these first two treatments will then go on to receive midazolam and usually require intubation and care in the ICU. The next step then, for those that have unfortunately ongoing seizures that last more than 24 hours from onset of anesthesia or where seizures recur after anesthesia is withdrawn is then considered super refractory status epilepticus. Now this timeline, as I mentioned, is now we're just up to 24 hours from when the seizures have commenced. However, um, there may be patients where the seizures have been have commenced well before the patient presents to hospital. Um, so the, they may be in the community, they may be managed at another hospital um, and then transferred to your center. Also patients that are already in the intensive care unit where um, the seizures may have been going for, for days or weeks before the diagnosis is made. 
Now, the reason why we're so concerned um, with these patients is that for adults, um, there, there's a high inpatient mortality of up to 40 to 60%. And for those that do survive, only a small proportion will return to their baseline level of function. On top of that, the treatments that we provide have a number of acute complications, um, both cardiorespiratory complications, hemodynamic instability, and liver toxicity from drug-drug um, interaction. And then for those patients, they also have these long-term complications, such as development of epilepsy, acquired brain injury, and poorer quality of life. Many of these patients um, require prolonged hospital admission and then go on to require rehabilitation and ongoing outpatient care. But unfortunately, there still is a lack of high quality evidence to guide treatment in these patients with most treatments um, based on clinical experience and expertise or um, retrospective case series or small um, prospective case series. So there are a number of treatment options available. And now there are more than 20 anti-seizure medications, a number of anesthesia agents that can may consider surgery or a vagus nerve stimulator, and then also a whole host of other treatments that are still emerging, um, such as targeted uh, temperature therapy, um, magnesium, immunotherapy, um, ECT, and ketogenic diet is one of the other treatments. Um, so what is ketogenic diet? It's a high fat, very low carbohydrate, adequate protein diet. Um, and looking at these figures, we look at our sort of standard diet. Um, in contrast, ketogenic diet has very different proportion of macronutrients. So 90% of calories uh, derive from fat, 7% from protein, and just 3% from carbohydrate. With classical ketogenic diet, it's usually prescribed as a fixed ratio. So you may hear it described four to one or three to one or two to one. And these are describing um, the grams of fat and on the right, um, protein plus carbohydrate. And um, for outpatients, most food and fluid will be provided in these set ratios. Um, in general, ketogenic diet in the context of epilepsy is used in early treatment of patients diagnosed with glucose transporter 1 or pyruvate dehydrogenase deficiency syndromes, but also as an adjunct treatment for those with drug-resistant epilepsy not amenable to surgery. And although traditionally used in pediatrics, now we're seeing you know, a huge increase in the use in, in the adult population as well. And with this, not just the classical ketogenic diet, but different variations, so modified ketogenic diet, modified Atkins diet, low glycemic index treatment, and MCT, or medium-chain triglyceride supplemented diets. And looking at efficacy in outpatients, approximately half the patients that try the diet will see their seizures reduced by half. About a third of patients will have over 90% reduction and 10 to 15% become seizure free. How does the diet work? Well, there's still not been found one um, specific mechanism responsible for the anticonvulsant effect of the diet. And it's likely a combination of factors um, induced by the ketotic state that underlie the mechanism. But uh, some of the um, mechanisms that have been, have been shown, um, firstly, looking at increased ATP production within the neurons, switching from carbohydrate metabolism or glucose metabolism to ketones, and also this idea of anaplerosis or the refilling of the TCA cycle metabolites um, induced by a ketogenic diet. The other thing to consider is the ketones themselves um, may reduce uh, neural excitability by um, reducing the pH within the brain. Also other mechanisms such as just the increase in fatty acid oxidation. Sorry. We just had the lights turn off. <laughs> um, 
we have these uh, increased in fatty acid oxidation and the anti-inflammatory effects of the diet. Also hormonal changes. So we have reduced blood glucose levels and um, ins circulating insulin levels, but also changes in the fluctuation of glucose and insulin levels. And then finally, more recently, we've been seeing um, the changes um, associated with gut microbiota that the diet induces. So as I mentioned, it's probably not just one mechanism at play, but a whole host of these changes associated with metabolism from ketogenic diet therapy. Now, when we are considering someone for ketogenic diet, both in the ICU setting and uh, in outpatients, we need to, um, there are a few contraindications. So the first one, and this is a, a major one about status epileptic as treatment is concurrent use with propofol. So often um, this is a barrier to starting ketogenic diet with making the decision to stop the provision and switch them on to a different agent. The mechanism um, is thought to be both a combination of um, increase in fatty acid oxidation that causes um, propofol infusion syndrome when propofol and ketogenic currently so the recommendation is um, patients should stop propofol before initiating ketogenic diet. Other contraindications are um, any deficits relating to fatty acid and carnitine metabolism, which are required essentially um, the high fat intake metabolism. And then also um, conditions that require high carbohydrate intake. So these are conditions such as pyruvate, carboxylase deficiency and porphyria. The last point is also thinking about um, pregnancy and lactation. So we, we really don't know the effect of ketogenic diet on a developing baby. Um, and there are some risks of increased metabolic, metabolic acidosis um, when ketogenic diet um, is given to mothers that are lactating. There are also some precautions to consider in patients that are receiving concurrent treatments. Um, so the first one being administration of insulin or oral hypoglycemic agents, in particular SGLT2 inhibitors, which increase the risk of ketoacidosis um, and particularly euglycemic ketoacidosis. Uh, should be mindful about patients that are receiving zanisamide and carbamazepine or other carbonic and hydrase inhibitors, um, as this may increase the risk of metabolic acidosis. Um, we should also be mindful of patients that have received sodium valproate, um, as they may be at risk of carnitine deficiency, particularly with high dose use, um, prolonged exposure, and those who have also concurrently received propofol previously. And the last one is renal replacement therapy. It's unclear whether um, ketogenic diet is, is suitable for patients receiving renal replacement therapy um, due to uh, losses of ketones across the filter, um, but also the metabolic needs of those patients. So although these are not direct contraindications, we may proceed more cautiously in, in these cases. Um, Looking at adverse effects of the diet, so the most common reported adverse effects um, when ketogenic diet is used in status treatment is hypoglycemia, metabolic acidosis, gastrointestinal um, disturbance and intolerance such as nausea, vomiting and diarrhea, hyperlipidemia, and very rarely pancreatitis, which is um, mainly being reported in patients receiving parenteral ketogenic diet. So looking at the studies that have been published in adults in patients receiving ketogenic diet therapy, there are about 13 studies, mainly retrospective um, small case series and two prospective studies. Um, and pulling the patients together um, in the literature, there's 47 being reported. Um, looking at these cases, the median number of treatments the patients received prior to ketogenic diet was seven, and that's a combination of anti-seizure medication and um, anesthesia agent. And the median number of days before um, ketogenic diet was initiated was 15. And there was a huge range in where diet was 
commenced anywhere between zero and 56 days. For 87% um, or in 41 of the cases, status epilepticus resolved and um, the mean median days to resolution was about six and a half days, but there were patients that um, improved much earlier. So although we know that there's high variability in the studies that have been reported and huge selection bias, um, I think there still needs to be further trials um, as to the, um, to really determine the safety and efficacy. So when's the right time to start diet um, in the context of status epilepticus? And I think this is um, a, a really difficult to determine um, given the lack of literature. Now there's this study that was published in 2019, which looked at um, the feasibility of providing ketogenic diet in early status epilepticus or um, at before 24 hours and before development of super refractory status epilepticus. And in this study, they had 11 participants um, that initiated the diet um, prior to one day, and 10 of those patients were able to achieve ketosis within one day. Um, and the outcomes of these patients, eight out of the 11 had um, resolution of their refractory status and three progressed onto super refractory status. So although a small study, it did show that it is feasible to provide the diet quite early on in the treatment schedule. Now, there are some advantages of using ketogenic diet um, compared to other treatments um, that we may use, such as additional anesthesia agents or anti-epileptic drugs. And the first one really is that being able to use a non-sedating treatment. Um, there are a low number of drug diet interactions or serious drug diet interactions apart from propofol. And if we're considering what happens to the brain during these recurrent seizures, the ketogenic diet may actually address that metabolic crisis that's occurring in that epileptogenic zone. Also thinking about those anti-inflammatory effects. So in those cases where um, the underlying uh, status may be as a result of a um, inflammatory condition or an autoimmune condition, then you know, may consider diet much earlier in those patients. And there's this, been some small cases in pediatric studies where um, there's a, the, the diet itself may be neuroprotective and particularly, in, as I mentioned earlier, the patients may suffer these long-term consequences um, with their cognition, um, that really early diet initiation may help this. We're on a timer today, it seems. <laughs> So despite, um, despite this, these advantages that I discussed, there are obviously a lot of challenges um, in providing ketogenic diet in the ICU setting. So the first thing we think about is we have a lot of um, uh, things that we give to the patient, a lot of treatments, so things like fluids, infusions, we have medication, sedation, and of course we're providing nutrition. And all of these we need to consider when we're providing ketogenic diet therapy. On the other side, we have um, all the outputs. So urine and GIT losses. We may be, um, the patients may be getting plasma exchange or renal replacement therapy. And then in the middle, we need to balance all of this out with their fluid balance, hemodynamic stability, and then optimizing both blood glucose and ketone levels. So it's at all of these points that we really need to consider how we're going to administer the diet effectively. So just talking a little bit about general nutrition in the ICU, um, and we know that patients that are admitted to the ICU are at high risk of malnutrition, and patients half a kilo to a kilo per day of lean muscle mass. And for a high proportion of patients, um, particularly prolonged ICU admission, will develop ICU-acquired weakness. And this may last years. And for some patients, they may not make a complete recovery. 
Now, one of the challenges in providing nutrition in the ICU is that on average, patients only receive 60 to 70% of the prescribed nutrition during their ICU admission. So when you're using ketogenic diet as a therapy, however, the patient's actually not receiving all the therapy you're trying to provide, this can be a significant barrier in the effectiveness. And the reasons for this, and just thinking about um, patients that are in the ICU with status, these are really attributed to feeding interruptions. So the patients may have to undergo airway procedure. Um, they may need to go to radiology for scans. They may need um, internal procedures in the ICU. And then also with high dose sedation, we know that patients are at risk of feeding intolerance, such as um, gastroparesis and um, ileus. So this further delays or impacts on the delivery of ICU. The other thing to consider is our standard feed is quite different to what we're prescribing when using ketogenic diet. And you can see the carbohydrate um, content is almost inverse. Um, so, and, and the ratio is almost inverse as well. So we are providing quite a different therapy to our standard ICU care. So if we are considering, um, or if you're considering putting someone on a ketogenic diet um, in this setting, it really does take a, um, a care team uh, communicating well together in order to provide the diet effectively. So you are both working, both your neurology team or epilepsy team are working with the intensive care unit. Um, you may have other teams involved in the medical care as well. So all the other subspecialties. Um, we will ha also have our dietitian, um, and this may be, you may have your intensive care dietitian and your neurology dietitian working together. And then of course you need the nursing staff, um, a pharmacist who's helping you look through the infusions um, and good communication with your dispensary or formula room. Um, so these are all really key aspects. And the communication plan is, is really vital um, for, to make sure that the diet's instituted correctly. Um, and thinking about that the ICU is a 24-7 service, um, so you need to have enough information available, um, particularly out of um, standard care hours. The next few slides, I'm really going to step through the specific nutrition prescription um, when, to consider when we're using ketogenic diet in the ICU. So the first part is thinking about overall energy goals. So gold standard determining energy requirements in the ICU are using measured energy expenditure through indirect calorimetry. So if you have that available um, and the patient's suitable, then um, using measured energy expenditure. Otherwise, you may have to use um, an alternative estimation method. So 20 to, um, 25 to 35 calories per kilo using an actual or adjusted body weight. When considering energy prescription, we also need to consider the patient's underlying condition and which phase of illness are they in. So are they in that very hyperacute phase, are they in back into the recovery phase, which may determine their calorie prescription. Um, and we also need to balance the um, overfeeding and underfeeding. So when um, there is a risk with overfeeding um, that is associated with poorer ICU outcomes, and it can interfere with ketosis as well. On the flip side, however, underfeeding also means that you can't generate ketones effectively and may put the patient at risk of malnutrition. So it can be a hard thing to balance. Looking at nutrition prescription, then looking at protein next. Um, so when prescribing protein, we have, do have to consider that protein itself can be gluconeogenic and therefore inhibit ketosis. And I showed you that calculation earlier with the fat um, on the left and protein plus carbohydrate on the right. Um, for the ratio, once you're giving more protein, you are reducing the ketogenic ratio. So when we're commencing patients on ketogenic diet, we may commence them um, at one gram per kilo and then increase them up um, as they establish ketosis to their um, goal protein intake. And there are some conditions in ICU where we would consider two to 2.5 grams per kilo protein requirements, which means that that four to one ratio is going to be unachievable. 
Um, the next part is thinking about carbohydrate allowance um, and usually carbohydrate provides three to five percent of total caloric intake. However, given that um, a lot of carbohydrate is present in a number of medications and infusions, you may not need to specifically prescribe carbohydrate from the diet, um, from the diet prescription itself, but need to do this cautiously and really closely monitor blood sugars to make sure the patients um, aren't experiencing hypoglycemia. And um, then finally, fat intake. So fat, of course, is providing the largest proportion of energy, um, but we should be considering the different types of fats that um, are being provided. So we need to make sure that the patients are um, meeting their essential fatty acid needs, so the EPA and DHA, um, and you may consider giving patients um, a greater proportion of omega-3 fatty acids, both for um, anti-inflammatory benefits, but also to um, reduce the risk of hyperlipidemia. Um, and then thinking about medium chain triglycerides. So these are um, fatty acids with six to 12 hydrocarbon lengths, and they're usually available as oil emulsion or now in some of the new products um, as part of the, the ketogenic diet product. And the advantage here is the rapid absorption of MCTs. So they're absorbed um, directly through the small bowel and into the bloodstream and are more readily metabolized directly to ketones and not stored in adipose. So it can really help boost ketosis but, um, and uh, quite rapidly when you introduce um, um, medium chain triglyceride fats. Separately, there have been some small animal studies that have shown that the MCTs themselves have um, their own anticonvulsant properties aside from when used in ketogenic diet. Um, so you may have this um, advantage of also being able to provide an extra anticonvulsant um, medication. Uh, there is a maximum tolerated dose, however, um, and often high MCT intake is associated with diarrhea um, and malabsorption. So this needs to be monitored quite closely. Um, and this can be often resolved with um, smaller, more frequent dosing. So usually the maximum tolerated dose is 30% of total calorie intake. So let's just work through an example um, I wanted to show. So a 60-year-old man that is in the ICU with a post-traumatic brain injury is then diagnosed with super refractory status epilepticus and sedated and mechanically ventilated. So I used um, a ratio of 25 calories per kilo um, with an estimated intake of um, 1,750 calories per day. So firstly, using that ideal ratio, four to one, um, this, the nutrition prescription comes out as 175 grams of fat, 31 grams of protein, and 13 grams of carbohydrate. However, this is well below the recommended daily intake of protein for adults, which is um, 0.8 grams per kilo. So I think you really have to consider whether this is the right prescription um, for, for adults particularly. However, you might start someone on this ratio and then move them, move them on to increase the protein intake to meet their requirements. So the prescription may change um, uh, whilst the patient's on, on the ketogenic diet therapy. So just working through the rest of the calculations, um, looking at providing 1 to 1.5 grams per kilo protein, that 3% carbohydrate and about 80% fat. Um, you may give 30%, as I mentioned, as MCT fats, and that's a proportion of the total fat intake. Um, this now modifies your ratio, um, and it may be between 1.3 to 2 to 1. Um, depending on how much protein you give. Um, now, you could sacrifice those um, a few grams of carbohydrate uh, in order to give protein to balance that side of the ratio. Um, however, it's usually given the infusions um, and medications the patients receive, it is difficult to get really below 10 grams um, practically. So we've decided on the ketogenic prescription. Now we move on to administering the diet. 
and now we're looking at the root. So in most cases, these patients will be able to receive tube feeding um, intrally into the gastrointestinal tract. Um, and depending on where you are, um, you may be able to access a pre-mixed or a ready to hang feed. Um, but in a lot of cases, you do use, need to use a modular feed where you're providing the individual components so that you're meeting your set ratio. And there's a lot of flexibility with that. So you can provide the patient's individual needs. However, it does mean that the prescription becomes a little more complicated and um, you may have to administer the, these compounds separately um, due to the high fat content. So you may get separation of the feeds. You may need to use an emulsifier um, in order to um, make sure that the feeds aren't separating. So this can be a little challenging. There are a couple of case reports um, looking at parenteral administration of ketogenic diet, and um, I, there isn't a lot of safety data uh, around this, though. So, again, you may need to involve your nutrition support team or your parental nutrition team um, to really consider whether this is going to be um, feasible. Um, you may use a compounded bag or um, with your pharmacist, or you may actually provide separate infusions of um, lipid emulsion, amino acid, and carbohydrate. Um, occasionally, we do use combination. So in patients that may have feeding intolerance or fasting um, or uh, they're having fat malabsorption, you may use parenteral lipid um, in order to um, sustain ketosis during those times where enteral nutrition is suspended. Um, we also should make sure that we're providing all the micronutrients that the patients need. Um, so their recommended daily intake for their age and sex, um, particularly given a lot of the pre-made feeds are for paediatrics, they, they won't meet um, the requirements for adults. Um, and in particular, looking at carnitine supplementation for those that have received sodium valparate. Um, so the next part is with initiated diet is thinking about the monitoring. Um, so we need to make sure that the patients are um, monitoring, uh, sorry, that the patients are tolerating the formula and that they're being delivered the amount that you have prescribed. Um, we'll also have regular glucose monitoring. Um, so in our unit, we set the lower limit for blood sugars at four millimole per litre, but this may be lower in other institutions. And we have an abbreviated hypoglycemia management pathway. Um, so we, where we treat with just five grams of inc incremental glucose. Uh, we also have regular blood ketone monitoring. We prefer to use blood ketones as they're more accurate um, compared to urine ketones, but um, it will depend on what you have available. Um, we also, as part of our standard ICU care, um, patients have their um, electrolytes, renal, and liver function monitored daily and specifically looking at metabolic acidosis. So we need to um, carefully monitor that too. Um, we will check their blood lipid profile at baseline and twice weekly thereafter. Um, if they're on parenteral lipid, we may do this more regularly. So on alternative days. And in some cases we may also um, monitor ammonia depending on the patient's clinical situation. Um, so they're the nutrition aspects. And then, of course, the ongoing medical management. So um, having clear communication with um, the neurology and epilepsy team, um, reviewing how the patient is progressing and thinking about their treatment escalation and de-escalation plan. So really making that as um, a joint team decision. So one of the things um, that commonly happens is inadequate ketosis. And um, I think this is a common question that comes up where um, the patients are on the diet for 48 hours and they're still in um, low ketosis. And um, these are just some tips to, to think through when, we, when this happens. Um, most commonly when we go back and review the patient, it is incidental or unavoidable carbohydrate um, administration. Um, and the thing really here to consider is that sugar-free doesn't necessarily mean carbohydrate-free. So we need to really carefully look through the medications um, and even brand brand variation is really important because um, there can be huge variation between the same product. So I'll use an example of sodium valproate. Um, 
so here in um, looking at a dose of 2000 milligrams per day, um, here in Australia, we have five different preparations available. And so it comes in syrup, it comes in sugar-free liquid, it comes in a soluble tablet, enteric coated tablet, and then also intravenous. So we can see that there's a huge variation in the carbohydrate content. Um, even the sugar-free liquid is, is 6.4 grams um, when we're only probably providing the patient with 15 or 20 grams. This is a huge proportion of their daily medication, uh, their daily carbohydrate allowance, and they're likely to be on multiple medications. So this is where you and the pharmacist <laughs> need to sit down and really go through um, uh, making sure that you are um, identifying the sources of carbohydrate. So the thing to check is really looking at all syrups and liquids. So often these are going to have some type of glucose, sucrose, um, or sugar alcohol, um, and avoiding them where possible. So using the tablet form. Um, but this may not be practical. So in this example of sodium valproate, we can use the 100 milligram tablets, but we're going to have to give the patient 20 tablets a day. It's just not feasible. Um, so having a discussion and looking at the nutrition prescription again, to see whether you can fit in um, the six grams from the liquid um, or if suitable to give them the IV replacement. Um, the other thing to think about is um, also steroid use. So occasionally the patients will need steroids um, and this is going to inhibit ketosis um, as well. And it just may be unavoidable. So I think thinking back to the slide where I discussed the mechanisms of ketogenic diet, although um, ketosis is, is, is what we're trying to um, achieve, given that the diet acts in so many different ways and even what we see in outpatients is patients um, do improve in very low level ketosis, there may still be an advantage to continue on, diet, on ketogenic diet therapy despite low ketones. But I think every effort should be made to try and get them into sustained ketosis. Um, the other things to have a look at are things like, um, uh, these are really practical things um, at the bedside. So rechecking the formula, um, your calculations, how the formula is being prepared and um, that the patient is actually receiving all the formula that you've prescribed. Um, so when you use a lot of powders, you can get powder displacement. Um, and so the patient's actually not receiving the correct volume um, and also the feeding pumps themselves. So some of the older generation feeding pumps um, really can't um, accurately deliver powder formula or can't deliver formula at low rate. So we um, really want to make sure that the patient is receiving all the formula that you've prescribed. Um, again, check for things like feeding interruption and intolerance and for malabsorption. Um, and then as the next step, if they haven't been given um, medium chain triglycerides, I would add um, MCT or increase um, think about carnitine supplementation. Um, so it may help with uh, generating um, better ketosis. And as a very last resort, thinking about reducing energy and protein intake. But um, this, as I said, would be the last resort given, given the issues of malnutrition. So how long should patients stay on the diet? Again, this has been quite variable and um, will depend on the patient's clinical situation. It does take a lot of MDT planning. So um, it may be that the patients are on the diet just for two weeks um, until um, keto, uh, status has resolved and, and the patient's been extubated and able to go to the ward. Um, but for some patients, you may continue diet um, post-discharge as well. Um, and it's going to really depend on the efficacy if they're um, having any adverse effects and how the patient's tolerating, tolerating the diet as well. The other things really to consider though is as the patients um, uh, get better, we will be looking to transition them for either enteral or parenteral nutrition onto oral diet. So uh, does, does your institution have the capacity um, capability to provide an oral ketogenic diet? Um, is the patient really a long-term diet candidate? So when we're in outpatients, um, counseling patients on starting ketogenic diet, 
We spend a lot of time getting the patients ready, um, getting them to experiment with recipes, getting their families involved um, before they actually start. And in, this, in these instances, the patient has not been able to be involved in those discussions. Um, so we really need to think about whether, whether they are a suitable candidate long-term. Um, and as we know, there are very few adult centres that provide ketogenic diet therapy. So we need to really think about that there is a place where the patient can get suitable follow-up at a diet clinic. Um, so the last part is looking at cessation of diet. This can be either done by um, incrementing carbohydrates um, back into the diet. Um, if with formula, we may use a combination. So putting them on say 25% standard formula and 75% ketogenic formula, and then titrating that down. Um, or in patients that are using the ratio method, you may just reduce the ratio from three to one to two to one to one to one, and then stop. Um, they should have close monitoring uh, for re-emergence of seizures. Um, and so if, if the seizures do recur, recur, having a treatment pathway to rapidly reintroduce ketogenic diet is important. And then um, particularly for patients that have been on the diet for a long time, um, just rechecking their micronutrient status um, to make sure they don't need any supplementation ongoing. So it's my last slide. Um, I, I think we're becoming increasingly aware that ketogenic diet um, is a suitable treatment for patients with drug resistant epilepsy. And um, there is emerging evidence that of ketogenic diet therapy to be used in other situations such as refractory and super refractory status epilepticus. Um, we should consider um, early commencement. So not waiting that two weeks um, and multiple treatments um, where feasible to start diet earlier. We really need a multidisciplinary approach to managing these patients in the ICU and onto the ward and into the community. Um, and we look forward to having more trials um, with controlled studies, looking at the optimal timing and duration of ketogenic diet therapy and status. And finally, I just want to acknowledge my team here at the Alfred um, and Monash University. Um, we work very closely with um, a number of departments, uh, both in the hospital um, uh, and at the university. And uh, this is just a picture of our, our institution um, with our hospital there on the right and our research institution there at the back. So thank you for um, your attention. Thank you, Neha, for this wonderful talk. It was very thorough and especially that you were very practical in what aspects are important when treating and dealing with patients with a ketogenic diet in the ICU. So it was very, very, very good. Uh, we have some questions from the audience. Uh, the first question, and you mentioned a little bit about it, is um, regarding uh, carnitine. So is there any recommendation uh, of adding carnitine uh, prophylactically uh, with you when there's a concomitant use with valproic acid? So the dose range for carnitine uh, is quite wide. So anywhere between 10 milligrams per kilo to up to 50 milligrams per kilo. Um, and in adults with a maximum of three grams per day. So we, in our protocol, we do prophylactically supplement all patients with carnitine um, because we think that the, the um, risk of deficiency really outweighs any risk of providing the supplements. Perfect. We have another question is, if you can give us any tips uh, regarding the avoidance of excessive thickness uh, and therefore uh, infusion like issues that can come up when you're dealing with a ketogenic diet in the ICU? Yeah, so this is a really common issue where the formula is hard to administer um, because it is so high in fat content and delivered at a low volume. Um, really, it is either looking at... Um, you can try and water the feeds down, but this can create different problems with the feeds separating. Um, I know some institutions do use um, emulsifiers, so they'll add emulsifier um, with the water to try and uh, uh, um, make the consistency thinner. Um, and then the other aspect, and again, it's 
a little, um, the evidence is a little unclear whether um, this is bolus feeding in the ICU is suitable, but you could consider um, transitioning the patient to, to bolus feeding where you're either using the pump to bolus um, the formula a couple of times a day or using a syringe. Um, but I am a little bit concerned about uh, patients not tolerating, so having high gastric residual volume or reflux and vomiting. Uh, and so this is this is difficult to manage, but it can help with um, making sure that the patients are receiving the formula as prescribed. Uh, perfect. Why do you think clinicians uh, take so long, like in this study that you showed us at the beginning, where they take so long to start ketogenic diet in status epilepticus? There's probably a few reasons. And um, I probably can't speak for the neurologists and the, and the intensivists. Um, we know that these patients are complex to manage. Um, they have they're an underlying condition to treat and then the seizures on top of that. Um, so it, it's hard to know um, exactly what the barriers are um, into making that decision. It, it may just be experience. So um, certainly the first patient we... Um, used ketogenic diet for uh, it was back in 2015 and now we've used it um, increasingly and so I guess the confidence of the team um, both the ICU team and our nutrition team and the neurologists um, they've all now had a bit more experience as time has gone on so the first couple are always the most difficult um, and then as you develop your protocols um, and just familiarity, it, it may mean that you have an earlier shift. Um, I think also, you know, we, we can't discount that the level of evidence is low. Uh, so I think that's something we do have to consider when you're looking at other treatments um, that, uh, that may have more efficacy. Um, or I, I think that's also one thing to consider. Um, so there's probably a range of reasons. Um, but I think it's important to have the discussions early uh, with the team. And, and once you decide that you're going to start, that you really start, um, uh, start aggressively. So, you know, winding all the infusions, changing all the infusions over, changing the medications and really rapidly introducing the diet. So not taking too long to introduce it either. This takes us to our next question. How long do you have to wait to start keto diet when you were when you had a patient on propofol yeah so this does vary from institution to institution the um in a lot of the american guidelines and european guidelines that i've seen um they do suggest that you wait 24 hours before um introducing ketogenic diet uh, after exposure to propofol um our team are um, may consider using the uh, using ketogenic diet a little bit earlier, uh, just because we know the propofol has such a short half life. So, given that the half life is only three minutes, um, sorry. Um, given the half life is so short, um, the risk is probably quite low. But I think, given that the the guidelines do say twenty four hours, um, and and that can be a huge reason for delay or reluctance to start ketogenic diet in the first place. So I think there needs to be a few more studies looking at this. Perfect. Um, there's another question regarding the catabolism of proteins. Like the patients in the ICU are in a state of hypercatabolism and um, we know that ketogenic diet is low or does, like it's very, it has to be very low on protein, otherwise it would, would not work. So how do you manage that? Yeah, so I think one thing to consider is that um, that lower protein intake is, re is really only in the beginning. And I think we should limit the time that they are, it is low in protein. So I think adjusting the diet over time is important so that we are managing those other aspects of ICU care. Um, I don't think the interference, from, from my experience, and so it's only talking from my experience, um, I don't think that protein, at least in adults, um, interferes with the diet as much as we 
we probably think. Um, and so it's really about monitoring. So if the patient's in good ketosis, um, they're tolerating the diet well, they've got good nutrition provision, um, then really adding, adding that protein back in and monitoring is the key. Perfect. Thank you. Well, we have um, no more questions from the audience. We would like to thank again uh, Neha Call for this amazing talk and for being with us today. Uh, and we hope to see everyone soon in our new in our next webinar.